You guys wanted it. This is Alphas versus Beta Males, part two. Let's get into it. Young Apollo with the beta. So you asked for a part two reaction of the Jubilee Middle Ground video, Are Men Superior to Women, Alphas versus Betas? And you can watch part one by clicking here. All right, let's get into our part two prompts. Here's the first one. Women should not be in position of power. Oh, is anybody really going to walk forward <laughs> for this one? <laughs> I mean, I think at this point, women have proven that they're that they're capable of taking on uh, taking on positions. I don't know if anybody's going to want to say they should not be. Very interesting. Okay. Dude, One inside. lone soldier. Game over. <laughs> Just like his aunt says. I'm, I'm the only one. I think a woman can be in a position of power only by herself, but not in relation to being in a relationship with a man. Because when, when she's in a relationship with a man, the man has to be the leader. The man has to be the one that's guiding the situation, directing the situation. If it's in any other situation by herself with work, you know, with her friends or whatever, she can do whatever she wants to do. Oh, my gosh. Whatever. Yeah, fine. Okay. You can say for most relationships, women are not going to be in the most elite positions of power in comparison to their relationship. I like that he did say if they're doing it in work and with friendships, that's fine or whatever. But I think there are plenty of relationships where if you boil them down, maybe a woman makes the, the most decisions. The thing is, you always boil down relationships in this way, and nobody who's in a successful relationship for the most part is worried about, like, who has the power, who's making the most decisions or whatever. It's just like we're taking life as it hits us, and it hits us every single day on a 24-hour loop, and we're doing it together, and that's pretty dope. <laughs> I think that's how most people are viewing relationships. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's like life is drinking from a fire hose, I feel like. The older right. you get and the more responsibility responsibility you get under your belt, it's just, it, it comes at you so hard, and, and I feel as though thinking about it in these terms, in this dynamic, it's just, it's almost a waste of energy um, to, to make sure that your relationships or your significant other and whatnot is underneath your power and underneath you at yeah. all times and it's just like life's too hard to approach it that way yeah it's like sir this is a wendy's <laughs> <laughs> game over okay your game is over <laughs> i first want to ask because there was a lot of like like has to have to's but like not really a reason behind it like can i ask like what's your reason behind like why a man has to be in the power like in power why can't a woman be in power power is such a weird word i'll say more like the leadership role and i and the thing is is that a man has to lead a woman he has to guide a woman because what happens is that when, when it's the opposite when a woman is leading that man she usually loses respect for him what does leadership even mean? Like we need to define these terms, right? If you, if he marries a woman and she's a stay at home mom, are you gonna lead her about like what's for dinner? Are you gonna lead her on how to take care of your children? Are you gonna lead her on like what to do when the, the family's sick or whatever? No, hopefully you would have picked a woman who is capable in that arena to where she's making the decisions on a daily basis as to how those things go. And that is a form of leadership. Uh, a lot of people view being a stay-at-home mom, which I presume is what this guy would want at the end of the day, by nature of calling himself an alpha male and saying he wants a submissive woman. I'm, I'm assuming he wants a stay-at-home mom. They invalidate that and say that that is not a position of leadership. To me, that is one of the ultimate positions of leadership in a marriage and in a relationship because you are making sure the place where your lives are, you know, being being uh, coming to fruition and flourishing and prospering is in line. You are making sure that your children who are going to go on to become adults who are other functioning members and leaders in society are being nurtured and reared in the correct way. That is a position of leadership. That does not scream submissiveness to me whatsoever. When she's in a relationship with a man who is, you know, under her, who's submissive to her in a lot of different situations, then she starts to lose respect for him because she's looking for a man to lead and guide her. If you notice- On what? Like, what is he talking about? Like, what decisions, a mortgage? Like, financial decisions? Is that what he's talking about? Like, where you guys go for dinner? I'm just, 
try, struggling to figure out like what are the decisions that relationships are making on a daily basis that it's like I need to make all of these decisions. Maybe he's talking about like bigger life decisions, which if that's the case, me being in a traditional relationship would would say, OK, yeah, I think you are smarter than me and I've picked a, a, a partner who is more capable than I am. By all means, you make the final decision on that. I'll give my input on things that I know about or things that I've looked up. But you make the final decision there. Is that what he's talking about? Because I just struggle to think of relationships that are like, is he going to make the decision? Am I going to make the decision? Is it 50-50 split? I want to make sure I'm in power. I want to make sure she's under me. They have sex with the bad boys, but then the nice guys get tossed to the side. You see, like, why is that? You yeah. see? Well, if you look at them psychologically, they have past traumas and issues probably. But like, look, there's, there's women for you, right? I mean, like, yes. all, you're on a different scale. What I would say, some women want a guy like you because they don't want to do anything, right? They don't want to take that position. Um, I'm around a lot of women who don't want that. Yeah, and I also just, I do not agree with this the rule that a lot of people say that. And it's mainly men who are saying this, that like nice guys don't get women. Nice guys absolutely get women. Uh, I don't know what their view of, an, of a nice guy is. And I think that's what we're getting mixed up here. If you mean like nice and that he's like, Oh, I'm crying all the time and like I don't I don't know what to do and you know here's flowers to make you feel better than maybe those guys aren't getting men but when I think of a nice guy I'm thinking like a good guy head on his shoulders does the right thing is nice to other people is chivalrous those men are by and large the ones who are getting women yeah I'd also add to I think I think there's a confusion here as to what age group and what maturation pro level they're at. So yeah, maybe that could be true when you're younger and in your teens or young 20s where like the bad guy gets the girl or something like mm -hmm. that. But as time goes on and life goes on and call it a couple of years even after that formational period of life, it's like the nice guy actually wins out in yes. the end. And it's just, it, it, it's it's so weird that they're even talking in these terms because it sounds so sophomoric. It does, it does. Like, first of all, the girls who want bad guys are not doing it because it's healthy and a good decision. They're not doing it because like, that's the, the thing to be or the place that they want to end up in life. They're doing it because they are, as Scott said, immature. And as this guy said, they probably have some other traumas that they're uh, working through. They're, they're in positions of power, not just in work, career, at home, uh, I know a lot of them. I do business, I find women much more pleasant to do business with. But when you're talking about maybe being at home, I don't know, it's just like, I think when you get into your part, your end of the pond, it can get a little bit mucky, you know what I mean? And I, I, I don't really subscribe to that as well. I heard you mm -hmm. say you were from New York. I lived in Manhattan for 30 years as a fashion designer in the heart of Manhattan. She was working as a fashion editor. I held it down with the three kids. I was the one bringing the money home. I was the one doing that. After, the, after my son, my youngest, went back to school, she went back to work. I always wanted to have my own collection. She was like, you should do that now. So guess what? She had the job. She paid the bills while I was building my company. So I could be strong in our relationship and be a man in our relationship, but I also got to know what it means to have a partner next to me and not someone that I have to lead. Well, and that's a beautiful, like, what a beautiful thing to do for your partner to go like, you want to pursue a dream and you want to go through this life having met that dream before you die. Let me do the hard thing and work for this right now. And not that taking care of kids isn't difficult, but let me go out there and work so that you can have your dream. And in isn't that a form of submission? Isn't he isn't she as even this the guy defined it in part one? He said submitting is submitting to my mission of of what my life is panning out to be and what I want it to be. Isn't that what his wife is doing by saying you have a dream? I'm going to submit to that dream for you. And in my way of doing that is by working. So whatever your the dynamic is of your relationship or what couples are doing you are all submitting to a larger goal that you have planned for you yourself your family i, I think when we talk about submission it's always just like a yes sir i'll do whatever it is that you want and you, you know you tell me where to be and at what time and i will be there and i'll listen and i won't give you any talk back or anything like that when you can submit to somebody or who they are in so many different ways yeah I, I Sorry, I was gonna. I was gonna add a point. It's like I, I think the word we should institute here or input here instead of submission is like sacrifice. Like to yeah. your to your point, you're talking about yes, you are submitting to something greater, which is hopefully a family that you're building together. Right. You're both submitting to that ideal that you're both building out. Um, so 
I think using the word sacrifice makes more sense in mm -hmm. actually in in relationships at, at large. Right. I think with the guy in the purple shirt that says submissive women are sexy, he just wants somebody docile. Like he yeah. just wants like yeah. a, a little lamb, which is fine. There are women who want exactly that. I think it's really, really important to specify what leading means. Right. And so right now we're talking about, you talked about, okay, we do the chores. Sometimes she pays more, sometimes I pay more. I, I think it's looking at a really superficial level. I think what you look at in a relationship, when you look at leadership and the one that is following per se, is who's the one holding down the emotional space? Like who has the capacity to show up as the rock the majority of the time in a dynamic. Mm -hmm. And if that is the woman, I believe for the most part, the polarity gets thrown off and there will be a deficiency in the sexual attraction that she'll have for you. If you are more excessively emotional and unstable than your wife, I do believe that's going to lead to issues in the relationship. Yeah, I mean, for anybody, I think that would be, if you are emotionally unstable, regard, like regardless of what gender you are, it's not gonna be a good thing for your relationship. Do I think women have more agency to be emotionally unstable in a relationship? Probably. Uh, and, and far more than I think than than men do in, in our current state of things. But yeah, an emotionally unstable partner is bad for any any situation. A man's job is to be the mountain that a woman's emotional waves crash into, like straight up. <laughs> so m women are always going to be more emotional than men. Men should be the stable ones. Men don't need to be crying in front of women. And ideally, they're not splitting chores. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, but I don't I think that if a woman cannot look up to you in some way, then she cannot respect you. And if she cannot respect you, she cannot love you. What does splitting chores mean? I don't know if this is getting edited down where I'm just missing. Me. What are the chores? Like what, what wouldn't you? <laughs> I'm just so confused. I, I got to think that the chores are like laundry, dishwashing, you know, household stuff. But, you know, chores can be done outside, too. Like, are you landscaping? Right. Are you handling the outdoor, the home structure? Like, right. are, you, are you doing all of those chores? Because that's within the same ballpark. man. Yeah, I'm just very confused on that okay so he said a, a man is supposed to be the mountain that a woman's emotional waves crash into i get what he's saying there mm -hmm. i can see where that's true like you come home you are you know emotional you've had a rough day or whatever you want somebody stable to help you see through things and be like you know what this is what we should do in this case and, and in this scenario i think that's what people would want from a partner uh, and irrespective of of who you are and yeah i think that that's true i think most people are looking for somebody who's stable who can see through the haze of the emotional issues you get into any day and as a woman you would want a man who goes okay let me fix this how do we how do we uh, get down to the bottom of this and if she cannot respect you she cannot love you I don't know. I totally just yeah. totally yeah. so and the only reason i didn't come sit down is because I have some really, really good women in, in leadership roles in my, in my businesses, and they are absolute leaders. Now, they might lead under me, but I think they stand alone as leaders, and I respect them enough that I would never come sit down o over that particular statement because it's too vague. But in the relationship, yes, sir, I do agree that a man should be the leader, he should be the breadwinner, and he should be the one solving all the problems out in the world and emotionally at home. I, I I, I just, I mean, I'm glad again that you, that you two say for work, it's fine. But when it comes to our relationship, I got to be the one to wear the pants. And I, not, okay, let's not say pants. We'll use the person's word. I got to be <laughs> the mountain that her emotions crash into. I hate to tell you guys, we can be very emotional too. And I know a lot of guys in my 55 years that are way emotional than some of these women out here now that are taking charge. Mm. So I think that's no. I agree with you. I agree with you. They are, but they notice. And I don't think it hurts notice, the relationship. Either. And if you notice, isn't it weird that nowadays they're talking about all these single, sexless men and all these guys having issues? Why do you think that is? They're becoming more emotional than ever. Exactly. I think no. I think women are putting up with less bullcrap. No. Both. Both. And it's going to be different strokes for different folks. Yes. No, no, no. no, no. Are they not putting up? I am not a sexless single guy. <laughs> No, I'm not saying you. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying this. But no one said you were. <laughs> my girlfriend is an emotional rock for me. That's what I mean. I'm sorry, but I got to strongly disagree with everything you say. I'm also a breadwinner right now. She, it wasn't always like that, though. Uh, she's going through a time and she wants to actually do something for herself. And I totally support that. I like Kevin. I haven't said this. I didn't say this in part one. I got to say it in part two. Kevin knows what's up. <laughs> and he's he's saying all the right things. Sometimes when I hear from men like blue suit and purple shirt, uh, and they're talking about women and the dynamics that they like to introduce into their relationship, it's all fine and good so long as you find a woman who's into that. And I always must put that disclaimer there. 
But it sounds like they've been hurt by women before, or maybe they've gone through uh, a dynamic where they were vulnerable to a woman and it got shut down or it maybe put her off in some sense. And I'm not saying that's what happened to them. I'm just saying it's what it sounds like. And I know a lot of men that does happen to them. The, um, oh, she told me that she wanted me to be vulnerable. And then I cried at this moment and then she was no longer attracted to me. And that should not then place in your mind a hard and fast rule that you could never be vulnerable with your partner. It should, in fact, state to you that that was not the right partner for you. And she, in fact, was not emotionally mature enough to be in a relationship in the first place. All people experience emotions, happiness, you know, sadness, elation, content, whatever it is that you want to you want to, you know, call the emotion that you're, you're dealing with. We all experience them. I think your goal is to find a partner who can see you through all of those emotions and still want to want to be with you. I personally would not want to be with a man who is unemotional all the time, doesn't say when he's sad, just like swallows it down and goes about his day. Even though people view that as being strength, I view that as a piece of yourself being shut out of our relationship and something that I'm not getting contact with and something that I don't get to see. And I want an open person who's going to share what they're feeling all the time. So if a woman shuts you down for being vulnerable, it's just not the right woman for you. And you should want somebody who you can share all parts of your life with. Does that mean you need to go be hysterical and cry all the time and be blubbering? No, that's emotionally unstable. But you should want somebody who you can share these everyday highs and lows with. And I think that's what Kevin is speaking to when he says, yo, my girlfriend is my emotional rock. I don't know what you guys are talking about. But when it comes to an emotional, whatever you just said, that analogy, look, I mean, I think that's the problem also with a lot of uh, toxicity that goes on because some men, a lot of men have emotions. You don't know how to express it. And then it turns into this opposite toxicity. How do I know this? I used to be one of them. Me too. <laughs> they, like, it feels like a lot of these like rich millionaires are the ones that like have huge high divorce rates and things of that sort. And I think it's because they're just genuinely unhappy. Like, is your woman with you for your security or do they actually like you as a person? Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see that like, yeah, like, yeah, women want me at first, but it, I don't think it ends well because after a while, like they want you for your security. They don't want you for who you are as a person and things of that sort. And that's why we see these mm -hmm. millionaires and all these like really alpha males getting high divorce rates. Cause I think at first I'll it starts off with like alpha. security. Money doesn't make you alpha. Yeah, the so. No, not at all, man. Not at all. Nope. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah, I'm about to say you educate me. That's why yeah. I came here. <laughs> well, I mean, you must acknowledge there are several men who think that is what uh, makes them alpha. Isn't there that you know famous phrase, "What color is your Bugatti?" Who did that come from? <laughs> so, might that insinuate that money has some sort of direct? value to whether or not you are an alpha male or, or considered one. So maybe that's not the message that they're endorsing. And I appreciate them, you know, saying, no, I'm not saying that money makes you alpha. At least that's not what they believe. But there are several men that do. A man can just be friends with an attractive woman. <sighs> can just be friends. Is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? No. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. If a man is friends with a woman, it says attractive, but I'm going to like t twist a little bit and say a woman that he is attracted to, personally is attracted to, which means not only are you attracted to the way that she looks, but you've also found a char characteristic in her that you like enough to be friends with her. What's the, what's the third step on that, you know, on that gr graph there? It's not a not a good thing for a relationship if your relationship goals are monogamy can can but can, can yeah sure no technicalities Some bro instances. <laughs> there's also like women you've known a long time who have like been around you know through all all of these things there's you know people women who are like they're like sisters at this point and you're like i couldn't even fathom being in a relationship with that woman anymore so that there's that so I think it's all about, again, as we've been saying before, it's all about choices. Um, I think if you find a woman attractive, it depends on, you know, are you going to choose to pursue her or not? Um, but for some of us, you know, like if we're speaking from personal experience, I've met many attractive women. Um, and that's not the only thing that, you know, I'm looking for. It's also about personality. So you, she can be a 10, but if it's like the, the personality is just, you know, someone who doesn't 
challenge me on a spiritual level, emotional level, um, mm -hmm. someone who also is like emotionally unavailable, like then it doesn't really matter. I, I have friends who are like, you know, I was considered very attractive, but then at the same time I could, and when I think about it, I, pro I wouldn't be able to stand like being alone in a room with them for like more than like <laughs> 10 minutes, you know what I mean? I could then are they your friends? <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> Acknowledge if like certain female friends of mine are attractive, but doesn't mean I'm like sexually attracted to them. And it comes to a point where like I see them as like sisters or just such close friends that even like the thought of them naked like grosses me out. Cause like, I just don't see them that way. I see them as like, very close like almost like family in some cases and things of that sort and you know sometimes like you grow up with certain women and you like you see them as like a sister and you see them as a close friend mm -hmm. and you just grow up and you don't see her like that fundamentally what's what's natural and what is possible i think are two different things is it natural to not be attracted to a very attractive woman to you i don't think so no. but with a lot of intention with it and your priorities are elsewhere and you're very intentional with how you're showing up in that space, I think you can do it. I think that was a question if it can be done, not if it's natural or not. If I'm attracted to you, honestly, I'm trying to, I'm trying to smash. You understand what I'm trying to, we, we, we gotta have sex. Leave it to him to just say it. <laughs> We all knew that's what he was going to say. And we have to have, be in some type of sexual situation or I don't really want to, you know, interact with you. On top of that, I don't believe in giving women non-sexual attention unless we're in a relationship. And the reason why is because I feel like uh, non-sexual attention from a man towards a woman is very valuable. So I'm not just giving you that just to be friends. <laughs> I wish I could just like wave a red flag over this guy <laughs> over like half the stuff that he says. Oh my gosh. So wait, okay, I'm I'm gonna be charitable and just the distinction like women that he works with, he's giving them normal attention and like, you know, you're just being a normal chivalrous guy. It's so weird that like his view of life is so like black and white and sexual or non-sexual and all these things. Like there's no, it doesn't seem like the whole pie is there. It seems like he's got just like, two slices and he's allowing it to take up the whole the whole thing i don't give non-sexual attention to women i don't want to be in a sexual relationship with that's wow wow wow, wow. you know so i'm saying like i'm not just going to do that for you and so what it is is that if i'm going to do that for you you have to be under my program which means that we're in some sort of sexual relationship between me and you you see what i'm saying so that, that's how i look at that i think that men and women Oof. can be friends it's just not because the man wants to Mm -hmm. Most often, it's the man is trying to sleep with the woman, right? And he's trying to hang around long enough for her to slip up and make that. Yeah. And, 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 exactly. and let's keep it a hundred, exactly. right? Yep. So, can they? Yes, and that would have been the technicality. Like when I saw you moving, I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, man, right? but, but overall, mm -hmm. most of the time, you're not going to see a man be friends with a very overweight woman. You're not going to see a man be friends with with a very unattractive woman unless there's some kind of financial reward there. Yep. So, by and largely, I don't buy guy friends particularly with any girl i'm seeing it's like yeah and any girl could test that right now and just text their guy friend and be like hey you want to do something saturday night and you see what the answer would be yeah right i think when I, when I think about it like and i had a technicality on the other side because i you know i'm like yeah part of me really believes that can happen but then i go back to my experience in life and my friends and it's really hard i i, I was running over there in my head like should i sit down but I was running all these scenarios from life experience of my friends who have said that, girls and guys, because it's not just guys, and it's never worked out that way. It just never is, and I think because, and it's if you find the person can be, yes, a person can be an attractive person, and you not find that person attractive, and you be friends. You have friendship and think, attraction. That's yeah. my thing. Yeah, Part of a relationship that. is is friendship and getting right. along, and then on top of it, you find that person attractive. No way. I just think it's a very rare, very rare thing. It you know, it, yes, rare. a person can be attracted to me and you not find them attractive, and I can be friends with that person, but if I'm finding that, or if you're finding that person attractive and you build a friendship, and you connect, yeah. and you connect then you, wanna, you probably want to be with them. That's, that's, I, wanna, <laughs> I don't think Adam and Mike say it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. but to me, just again, in my experience in life and just knowing my friends and people, I don't know one that has worked out that. Yep, I have this beautiful friend and every single guy that tries to enter her life as a friend tries something at some point. It's just without failure. I think maybe one of them has not. And without fail, I mean, you'll go out drinking as like a friend group. Oh, what are you doing after this? Or like, you know, what are you doing next week? And they're, they're friends, right? And they refer to each other as friends, but the men always, 
always try something because they're just waiting. They're waiting for an opening, like sharks. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong with like your own experiences. Obviously, if that's what you've seen or that's what you personally experienced that like you yourself couldn't be in a friendship with a woman, like, Again, that's your personal ex experience, though. Whereas the question is, like, can a man, any man, be in, a, like, a regular friendship with a woman? Like a real, real friendship? Yeah. Like, they're actually really friends? Yeah. And he I, not want to sleep with yeah. her and find her attractive? Right. No. I don't, I don't, yeah, I think it's, I think it's BS. Because, like, at that point, like, you're also, we're also talking about, like, now we're talking about, like, what is an attractive woman, right? And are we talking about just looks? Because in this case, like, there are people who, like, honestly don't, don't, like, have sexual, like, desires for a woman who isn't like emotionally linked. I think it's, is she attractive to you? Yeah. I think that's like the basis of it. When you look at specific situations, so for some of these females that work for you, for example, if they're very attractive, do you feel, I would imagine you have the, the capacity to compartmentalize that? Gift from God. Yeah, man. I just, it, the second I sign their check, it's gone. It's gone, right? So it's just, I think it's the same thing with friends as significant others as well. It's like, I have the ability to compartmentalize it where it's like, all right, this attraction is just dissipates. So is that the barrier that can make a man attract a man attract a man friends with an attractive woman? If there's that barrier of him being in the relationship or are you working for them? Well, first of all, we're not friends. You work for me. Right. You know, I care about you. I think the barrier that they're talking about is litigation. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Uh, and they are with friends. You don't have that barrier uh, because what happens in between the female employee not being hired and you signing the check? you become liable for your actions towards that woman. Uh, but that's just me talking. Fully, you're part of the family, right. but you work for me. We're not personal friends. Right. And me and you will not be in an atmosphere. We're alone. Right. So when you go exactly. back to it, is it a thing where if you're both single, do we all think that you could be a friends with an attractive woman? If we're both single. Don't know. Nope. I don't yeah. know. No, no. I don't know. <laughs> a man should not cry in front of his kids. Disagree. It ain't popular. It's not gonna be popular to say this. But ideally, you're not gonna cry in front of your kids. They cry to you. Is it fair? No. Is life fair? No. Is the dynamic between a man, a woman, a child fair? No. But personally for me, I wanna take that responsibility of being the one that's stronger than all of them. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that responsibility. I want that responsibility in my life. I wanna feel like I was a hero to them in every way. And I don't think a man that cries in front of his family is not the hero, but ideally, I'm not gonna be doing that. Sh right, I, I mean, that's personal preference, that's up to him. And it seems like he kind of has that natural demeanor anyway, so it might not be something that he's often at risk of doing anyways, but crying in front of your kids does not immediately like dissipate the structure of your relationship with them and make them view you as a person without strength. And I think that's an important note to hit. And what I'm hearing a lot with young people now, particularly Gen Z, is like, I grew up with these male figures who never cried, or like my grandfather never cried, my father never cried, and then they go on as specifically young boys to feel these sort of emotions where they do want to, and then going, well, my dad never, or my grandfather never, or whatever, so that's what I'm meant to do. And of course, when you're young, you feel emotions, I think, far more and maybe a little bit deeper than you do when you're old. Not not deeper, but it's just more sensitive. You're more trigger sensitive than ad adults would be. So you're seeing an older version of your dad. You're seeing an older version of your grandfather where they're not as sensitive to the things happening around them, where they might not cry and that might be totally natural to them. I think becomes an issue if you're a man trying to like suppress this urge that you have to cry. Maybe they don't naturally have the urge. Uh, and that's fine. But if you're like going in the closet to hide from your family and cry, maybe we reassess. Yeah, I think there's also a difference to I, I, being the rock for your family is a thing within um, malehood and mm -hmm. uh, being a man of the for your family. And but I think there's a difference between crying in front of your family um, and it, it's really about um, it's really about the way in which you react to your children crying and showing them yeah. or teaching them. Um, you know, the thing that hurts you may or may not be uh, a hurtful situation, a hurtful word or a hurtful, um, you know, instance. And, and you can teach them to uh, work through their emotions mm -hmm. and you can do that um, by helping them navigate that. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the one crying, um, because as the kid gets older and if you've taught them properly uh, to navigate those emotions, 
um, and to to cry when crying is ne- necessary, right. to, to be happy when ha- being happy is necessary, and all so on and so forth. If you teach them how to navigate those properly, they will understand that in your life, you too had to go through this. You yeah. too cried. You too felt these emotions because that's the only way that you would have been able to teach them how to get through them. Yeah. So it's there, there's a different dynamic here that I think they're they're not diving deep enough into this discussion um, as mm-hmm. you're hitting. Like there's just so much more to it. Yeah. What you brought up reminds me of something interesting. Or, or like it's just a phenomenon that we see if you watch say a video or maybe you have like little cousins or you have kids yourself and a kid like bumps their head or, or they fall on their knee and they sort of look up to the adults around them before they respond and as a mother or a father some parents feel this natural sense before anything has happened or any reaction to go like oh no oh my goodness you fell are you okay are you okay and you'll watch the kids sort of process the panic from the parents and then go this is a moment where I cry. And then they start crying. Other times you'll see the kid like bump their head and they look around and the mom goes, oh my gosh, you bumped your head. Oh, aren't you so clumsy? And they're like, you know, talking to them and the kid goes, oh, I'm not gonna cry because it doesn't, I'm not getting this panic from the people around me. So I think it's all about just being emotionally stable, but certainly there's natural instances where it would be normal for anybody to to cry. Like I think of maybe a father, a family member dies or something like that. Are you gonna suppress the the feeling of tears being brought on because you think that's a sign of of strength and a position that would be totally natural for anybody of any age to cry that would be an issue uh but maybe that's not what he's maybe it's not what he's talking about you know it's weird I, i've never actually seen my dad cry till this day <laughs> like not even once the kids is- haven't seen my dad cry either nope looking to their father for that strength and so if they're seeing their dad cry right I feel like that creates fear in the situation the kid has with their father. See, I don't, I don't agree. And I think I, not seeing your dad cry is not inherently positive. It's not inherently negative, And it is wholly dependent on who your dad is as an individual. Disclaimer. But I think my view on it for at least my personal situation is not seeing my dad cry at any instance means that I don't really know who he is that well. And I don't really have a good gauge for like where he's at emotionally. If you're just getting like this plateau of just an unemotional man all of the time, who's constantly just being logical and analytical about everything that's going on, it's not, I don't want to say dehumanizing, but it doesn't build that like deep emotional structure that I think a lot of people are looking for in their parents or when they look back at their parents going, oh man, I never, you know, that never did happen. And men view it as like, oh, I'm showing my weakness. This is a horrible thing. Like my kids have seen me cry. They're never going to look at me the same, but it can be a really powerful thing for kids to see that and go, oh my gosh, this is a moment like where we're bonding together in this shared emotion or, you know, my dad actually does go through hard stuff and it's not just us. And it's not just like mom, it's everybody goes through that. And what can be even more powerful is to watch a man who wants to cry and he cries and then he navigates the problem that brought about that emotion. Like that's a really powerful sign of strength. If you're crying in front of your kids, it's the same thing as crying in front of your girl. It, it, it's, it's a, it's a bad representation of what you're supposed to be in that situation <sighs> for them. I feel like somebody who hurt you, <laughs> who hurt you? Oh, uh, now I'll tell you when I do cry. Bro, when you see like one of those kids with Down syndrome get put in a high school basketball game, he starts nailing threes and Jim goes crazy, bro, I'll be crying my ass off. I'm so happy for the kid. <laughs> so are you like not gonna do that in front of your kids? Cause it's a bitch thing to do. I just don't understand. So even if you're having like a happy cry when you're watching something beautiful, would you allow your kids to see that? That's what I want to ask him. Or is that a sign of weakness too? <laughs> it's like happy, I'm like laughing. I'm like, you know, but other than that, man, uh, no, not at all. Okay, so I'm, I think he's saying he would allow his kids to see that. Call me him. <laughs> Can the person who like has kid? I was asking the dad. I have a father who I've never seen cry, so I get that. I was that man. Again, you have to understand my kids and my middle girl, my middle world daughter, who I'm going to talk about is 26 years old. Now, for some reason, out of all three of my children, that middle girl. From the time she turned 13 to 17, 18, we just butted heads, butted heads, right? And the relationship wasn't going to where it should be going. And I want to be close to my kids. We sat down, she was about 20, maybe 19, 20 years old. We had a heart to heart about our feelings and how we really felt about each other. And I cried. And 
six years later, some years later, better relationship than we ever had because she saw a human part of me and not just me trying to be what you guys are talking about, which is a good thing too. You can count, my, my wife can count on one hand how many times she's seen me cry. I think my son had and my other daughter have it. But I'm gonna tell you for that enriching moment, and that's again, just coming with years of having those tears with her and talking about how important it was that our relationship worked and then hear her come back and saying she felt the same way and breaking through that, I'm the father, I'm gonna be the strong one, mm -hmm. made her break down and both of us be closer than we ever have. And think about how long it took him to have that conversation how much sooner it probably could have happened and you could have broke down this barrier. And that's another thing to sort of speak to is that it's often fathers can just be like this brute force that you're constantly engaging with. And again, like emotionless, they're just looking at the problems, they're solving the problems. For his daughter, it seems to see him cry was like, oh, you are just like me. You're not just this like dominating force in my life that is here to like set things straight and not be emotional. And that could be a really powerful thing to connect with your kids. Not for everybody, but for some. Can I ask you a question about sure. that? Do you think that if you could have set her down earlier than the age that you did and just had a vulnerable conversation that maybe it could have happened, like it wouldn't have had to build all the way up to tears? No. She wouldn't have been able to hear it or? No. So he's saying you could have a vulnerable conversation without the tears. He's so focused on the act of water falling from the eyes, which is so interesting. Like why, why is that the moment in particular? So if you're a man and you're, you're telling your daughter, you know what, I'm really sad about our connection. I'm really sad about our relationship. I'm sad about the dynamic that we're dealing with right now. And it's causing me stress and I want to connect with you. And he says that in a vulnerable moment, that's fine. But if you say all those things and a tear falls from your eye, that's like a, She's lost respect for you. You're weak. You, you've, you're, you're submissive. Interesting, because he's saying without the tears, not without all the, the meat of the actual conversation, without the tears. Because what was going on from my understanding of our relationship is that, you know, young people, I'm very independent. My children are very independent. They don't want to be controlled in a certain way. And as a father, you still have to keep that control. She was only seeing that side. So she was only seeing this domineering person trying to squish what she thought that she wanted to be or who she wanted to be. And that wasn't it. I was just trying to play the father role. I saw my dad do it. Not, never a tear. He's that man, you know? And I was raised by that man and I took that on. I remember sitting my son down and telling him, boys don't cry. And I still to this day regret that. And I yeah. still talk to him, he's 24. I still talk to him about, I was wrong. Because I do not think that's the way we're supposed to live our lives. And I think that's why you go back to the statistic of how a lot of men are depressed. We're supposed to have emotions, we're human. Now, I don't believe every time you turn around, you should be in front of your children ooh, and your wife like, you know, I think that's a drastic thing. Mm -hmm. But I know dropping a tear as a father for me made a relationship and that, so much closer and so much better than it would. I'm telling you, I know what that it would have ever been. You and we know for most men, it's going to be rare anyways. Like nobody wants to sit and cry in front of people if you're a male or a female. It's not something that most people are like, you know what, I really wanted to cry in front of all these people today and now I'm not going to do it anymore. But to say, you know, it's okay if the moment brings that, that's totally fine. You don't, you don't think you could have shown that vulnerability without the tear? <laughs> you hear him? He goes right back. You don't think you could have shown that same amount of vulnerability without the tear? So just the act of water falling from somebody's eyes seems to be a a very just powerful thing for him. I don't know if it means that you're just like, you're allowing the, your physical nature to sort of submit to your emotions and that's why he has such a problem with it. It's very interesting. No. My dad was capable of expressing emotion, not from the standpoint of being a whiny little baby. He held, down, held it down on my family. My parents are the happiest couple I've ever seen still to this day. Um, but my dad was able to, and still is able to, at funerals, be able to show emotion during movies when he feels the emotion, be able to show up and do that. Um, he, I'd never see him whining about like what you guys are saying, whining about just issues happening in his life, like at work and what he's doing. Never. He deals with that on his own, but he is showing up vulnerably when he is experiencing an emotion, not from a, a whiny baby place, but from a freeness that he has with it. And, uh, I even think like when I first went off to college, you know, he's, he's tearing up too. So I would just it's like to say, beautiful. um, this is a field I specialize in. I'm a program manager for a nonprofit that focuses on mental health. Um, and a lot of the times what we, what we get in our clients are men that are coming in dealing with childhood trauma of these expectations and standards of trying to live up to the quote unquote masculine um, ideal. So a lot of the times we, we have men coming in because they're still trying to seek approval in their thirties, or they're still trying to get that male validation, you know, in their forties. And 
it goes back to making sure we understand the difference between regulating your emotions and suppressing them. I think it's, that's why I said 100%. earlier, like to be an alpha, you have to be balanced. You guys can be emotional as well. You guys can be vulnerable. It doesn't make you less than just. Yes. Yes. Snaps. <laughs> like a woman being more assertive doesn't make her less than a woman. If you feel like you don't want to promote being emotional in front of your kids, you know, I've asked the question, does that kind of fall into toxic masculinity for your son? Well, first, I, I, I didn't say anything about not being vulnerable. Vulnerable is the word that I brought up. So I think being vulnerable is very important. I think crying, physically crying in front of your kids is not ideal. This is not about an ego stroke or, or trying Why? to be overly masculine. I think being vulnerable as a man is one of the strongest things a man can actually do. It's just that I don't think that crying, particularly sobbing, is going to be very healthy as the leader and the person that they're supposed to come to for that safety and that care. But isn't real vulnerability then? Then you're just not being honest, but like, yo, babe, sorry. I had this thing. I just, I left and I cried. But now I'm here to be strong with you. That's I real vulnerability. I can't think of a scenario where I'd leave to cry. Yeah. So he's just saying maybe he just naturally would not cry. And then he's getting that confused with this message that men should not cry and they should never show their kids that that side of themselves. If you don't naturally go that way with your emotions, then that's fine. But then to go, men shouldn't do that with their kids when for most people, it is natural to cry at least once in your lifetime. Uh, and for, for most men, it is natural to cry. Uh, it, it's, it's such a weird, weird thing. See, I so he's just not crying, period, which is fine. That's just not, it's not, it's not who you are. But needing feels performative. I'm trying to show you how vulnerable I am. No, no, it's not necessarily showing. It's, it's I think you can be very vulnerable right. without crying. Yeah. People just express their sadness in different ways. You can be, but I heard what you guys were saying earlier, and I agree with that. It's like, you know, you don't want to be a crybaby about things. We don't, right? But it's like, to be at, for instance, if I'm at a funeral, and this person meant something to tell me, no, can't do that. Or I see something on television or a movie that moves me, like you can't do that. It's like kind of like a very weird thing. And I, I, I think you guys touched upon that. There's just I, like a- Kevin for the win, y'all. <laughs> Kevin for the win. Weird stigma behind like crying because it seems like we keep associating crying with weakness. And then the issue is that like, again, there is a big difference between crying and sobbing yeah. yes. so, hysterically sobbing like i think that's only do if you like say you lost a loved one like really close to you like like not like say like your significant other say like horrible accident like stuff stuff like that which would be for anybody like uh, do, are you like guys dating women who are sobbing all the time like why who's sobbing uh outside of moments of extreme emotional duress that's not, it's not normal to just be sobbing for, for random things for anybody, any, any sex. You know, like there are obviously scenarios for that, for like regular crying, again, kind of like we, we all touched upon that we're not saying that you have to cry every other day, but like there are like cases where it's, it's okay. It should be okay. As kids, we look for like, we look up to our dads to be able to, re how do we react to certain scenarios? Do you feel that like, okay, like. For instance, like my dad didn't cry. I don't think I've ever seen my dad cry. I've seen very bad, and like sad scenarios, straight face, you know. And I feel like I developed that as like a kid, like as a, as I got older. Like I have to keep this inside because that's how exactly just how I saw my dad do it. How would you basically t like explain to your kids how they feel like they should let out their sadness? Should they keep, especially if you feel like you're not really expressing sad emotions in front of them? I think probably the best thing I can do is like explain to you what my goal as a father is is to explain them the truth of the world truly hey this is the truth of the world this is how the truth of the world is that men cry so are you trying to explain that to your children <laughs> i just don't i don't understand the world is here's some competencies and things you can do to set yourself up because my ultimate goal for my children is to have choice so i can have a son he could be gay he could cry he could be straight he could cry like I'm, it, like i could have daughters that were dominant masculine i don't care as long as they have choice i personally my preference and, and what I aspire to be and what I want to be and what I get to be is that strong man for my family. We all kind of believe that like we have to be a hero for our kids, right? Especially when they're super young. And honestly, I agree. I think, I think it's totally like, you need to be a role model for your kids, you know? Mm -hmm. And you need to be a safe space, which I completely agree with. But things happen as they grow up, you know what I mean? Especially when they go towards their teen years, when they start being more in touch with their emotion when they're actually like feeling a lot of different things and feeling the pressure of society and
everything that's collapsing around them. Sometimes they don't just need like a hero, they need a father to like commune with, to like actually talk with. Yes. <laughs> a beautiful way to close out the episode. <laughs> And this is one of the middle grounds where I sat in the middle ground, just in between these two different groups. So what a fascinating conversation. Let me know what you guys think of the different issues that were brought up, different people's takes on it. Drop it in the comments down below. And as always, we encourage healthy debate and do us a favor, like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time we post a video for you guys, which is every single day, almost without fail. And I can't wait for the next Jubilee Middle Ground. You know, we got to keep up with them. Bye, guys.